Amen. Well, good evening to you. What's today? August 21st? I wrote the wrong date on my check. They'll still, it'll still get deposited, though. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's still good. Amen. What's, what's a day, you know? But anyway, we are, um, you know, I never, I never got to actually preach last week, um, which was a good thing. So, um, but we're still on the weapons of our warfare or fighting the good fight of faith. Amen. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. We'll just read it real fast. Amen. Anybody feel like even today you've been fighting a good fight of faith? Or you, or you just feel like you've been fighting? <laughs> but keep on fighting. I want to encourage you. Keep on fighting. Keep on fighting the way God intended you to fight. And so this is Paul. He was talking to his son Timothy, uh, his son in the, in the Lord. Uh, he says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, wherein too thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. And so, tell the person next to you, said, you got the fight, the good fight of faith. Amen? Isn't that right? Let's look at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter and verse 7. You know, I just found out recently that um, I, I didn't know that, but when Paul uh, wrote this verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, it is, uh, a, um, it is thought that he was 56 years old. But the whole point was, he said, I fought a good fight, I kept the faith, and he said he finished his course. Isn't that something? I would have thought Paul was like 80 years old or something, had a long gray white beard. And so I thought it was just amazing that, you know, it's so important for us to fulfill the plan of God in our lives. Um, you know, and so everybody's lifespan isn't the same. Now, I believe if Paul wanted to live longer, he would have lived longer. But I mean, the Apostle Paul had a hard life. If you've been shipwrecked, put in jail, I think if the Lord told you you're finished, I think you might take off because, you know, this prison thing is I don't like this no more. The shipwreck thing. I don't like being uh, uh, having a thorn in my flesh where a, a messenger of Satan has been assigned to me. is always harassing me, always giving me trouble. You know, but God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. You're going to be all right. Right. And so but I thought it was interesting that Paul was uh, supposedly 56 years old when he wrote the scripture. But second Timothy four, seven, if I gave it to them, did I? Did I? Maybe. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. <laughs> but Paul told Timothy, he said, I have fought a good fight. He said, I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. He kept the faith. In order for us to fight the good fight of faith, we're going to have to keep our faith, hold on to our faith. Isn't that right? And so, and so that's very important for us. I want us to go right to uh, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. And this is called fighting the good fight or, or yeah, fighting the good fight of faith. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Praise the Lord. How many of you, how many of you know uh, some days when you wake up, you don't feel like fighting a good fight of faith? You wish you could just cruise, right? Lord, can this just be a regular day? I don't, you know, I don't want to do anything extra today. <laughs> I don't need anything extra happening in my life. But God's always working on something. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12. For we wrestle not. That word wrestle it means it means struggle. It means to be it means to be focused and and determined to wage in warfare. 
And so, for we wrestle not. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness, against wickedness in high places. Remind me, I want to go back to, to this verse, verse 12. Verse 13, let's read that. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, not part of it, but the whole armor. Now, the armor, uh, there are... God has given us defensive armor, and he's given us offensive armor. And so all of it, whether it's something that we put on or whether it's something that we jab with or inflict pain with, it's all designed for us to fight a good warfare. It's all armor because we are engaged in a warfare. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and somebody say, the evil day is the day that I'm tempted to disbelieve God. The, and the evil day is the day that the scriptures, the word of God that you've been standing on, you're going to be faced with something that's going to come contrary to that word, and you're going to have to stand there and fight and say, I believe God. I believe his promise. I believe what I have on my prayer list. I believe what I prayed in my prayer closet, and I don't care what I'm facing right now. God's promise belongs to me. Wherefore, taking you the whole arm of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, that doesn't mean the most important thing. It means above all or it means over all. So the shield, when you're in warfare, the shield protects the whole man. The shield is the thing that's standing out there in the front. You understand? So it's protecting the, the man or the person behind the shield. So when he says, above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith we shall be able to quench all all the fiery darts of the wicked. Amen. And then it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All right. Now, uh, uh, the last time I was, was up talking about this message, I was talking about the word of God uh, being uh, the sword of the spirit. But I want to go back now. I want to backtrack and talk about uh, the loins, the um, strapping our, our loins with the belt of truth. So, the, so there's, the, there's the word of God, the sword of the spirit, and I'll go back to there. But then let's start with the, the first thing he said is girt, to gird about with truth. And so if we don't have the word of God, the word of God is the scriptures. It's the Bible. And I found out when you, when you wear... Um, when you're in war and when you wear your armor, that the loins are covered with a belt. And the belt holds the shield. There's a parking place for the shield. And there's a parking place on your belt, loin belt, for the, for the, um, for the sword. Amen? So, attached to, so the loin belt is the basis of your armor. You understand? And being a Christian and being in the kingdom of God, we need to understand that everything that we live by, everything that we believe is based on the word of God. Isn't that right? So if we don't have the word of God, I mean, we even needed the word of God to get saved. So we start off, we start right off with the word of God. And so that, lo that loin belt, that belt of truth was the most important part of the armor because there were other parts of the armor that were connected to it. And so if, you're, if your loin belt dropped, then, then you had to spend all day picking up the stuff that you dropped. And so Paul is telling, t uh, telling uh, them in Ephesians to put on the whole arm of God, but the, main, the, the starting piece that you need is the truth, and the truth is God's word. It's, it's the Bible. And so the Bible is the basis of everything that we do. It's the basis of everything that we believe. It's the basis, the word of God, the written word of God, is the basis and gives us the strength and the backing and the authority of everything that we do 
in this spiritual war warfare, in this spiritual fight that we're in. Amen? How many of you know that you have, you have an enemy? Now, I hope, I hope after tonight that, <laughs> that we're not casual about, about the devil. Amen? I want us to go back to verse 12. Is that where I said I wanted to go back to? Let's go back to verse 12, Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Now, I want us to see here, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we're not fighting against people. Is that correct? We don't fight against people. We, we can't fight a spiritual war. When the Bible's talking about fight the good fight of faith, obviously, we know he's not talking about a world war, right? He's not talking about a war where everybody goes marching out and, you know, but we are marching in the spirit. There are things, there are activities happening in the spirit, but we wrestle against an invisible kingdom. And if in this verse, it talks about levels of the enemy. And it talks about principalities. It talks about power. So we wrestle not against people or governments, at least uh, worldly governments, but our we wrestle against, number one, principalities, we wrestle against powers, we wrestle against rulers of the darkness, and we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. That word, that the word principality, uh, do you remember um, a couple weeks ago when I said that, that Satan, he, he is very organized, and so we need to be organized. And what we believe, we need to know some scriptures so that when the enemy who is organized, who never slumbers or doesn't sleep either, he spends day and night, uh, 1 Peter 5 says, looking for Christians that he can devour. And so that means we get a spiritual visit from Satan periodically because he's coming to us trying to find out, can I get through to this person to make them fail? to make them disbelieve God, right, to, to ruin them. So the word seek, when 1 Peter 5 talks about the devil, who is our adversary, he roams about seeking who he may devour. So, so that lets us know that he can't devour every Christian, but he can devour a lot of Christians, right? I mean... The things that are going on in the body of Christ is just crazy and ridiculous. It's, you know, you can't even tell that they're born again. They don't even know that they have authority. They don't even know that they have power. Now, Colossians says that Jesus stripped Satan of all of his power over us. So really, we're, we have more power. We have access to more power than he does. But we got to dress up right. We, gotta, we have to uh, uh, have our feet sh shod with the preparation of gospel peace. We have to have on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our position. If we don't have on the breastplate of light righteousness when the devil comes at us and accuses us of being sinners and no good and all the, and all, oh, you still your old self, we have to have on that breastplate of righteousness that tells us, no, I've been made the righteousness of God, devil. And you can't tell me, you can't accuse me of my past because it's too late. I've repented, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but the breastplate of righteousness is, is, a, is an, a piece of the armor that we have to keep on at all the time. But the Word of God is the basis because what we have on our head, what we have on our chest, what we have on our feet, all of that is based on the Word of God. You know, one of the major weapons of, is, is the Word of God. But it's the word of God that where we get all our other weapons. Isn't that right? If we didn't have the written word of God, we wouldn't have the blood of Jesus as a weapon. We wouldn't have prophecies as a weapon. We, we wouldn't have promises as a weapon. We wouldn't know that. But everything's based on the word of God. And so God wants us, uh, he wants us to know that we have an enemy who is clever and he is strategic and uh, so principalities, that's an ancient word. It, it means a high position of power and authority. When, when, when de the devil got kicked out of heaven, it's, it's said that he took, he took third of the angels with him. 
And so, but he began, once he got kicked out of heaven and all the third of the angels followed him, Satan set up his own dark kingdom because he, he hates you and he hates me. He hates mankind. He wanted to be like the most high God. And so he's mad because he knew that God made man in his image. And, and as a born-again believer, he's mad because he knew, he knows that the power that he tried to get, we have. But we don't know that we have it because our loins aren't even girt about with the truth. And so that means all the other armor is disconnected. And laying on, you know, when the scripture says, uh, uh, verse 14, I think, it says, take and, and above all, take the shield of faith. That word take, see, Paul, remember Paul wrote, um, he wrote the New Testament based on the Roman government, when, uh, on the Roman Empire. So he often uh, used the, the Roman Empire, the way they lived and what their civiliz uh, civilization was, he used it to depict or to demonstrate what the word of God meant. And so uh, if you were a soldier in an army, you took care, you you took care of your armor every day, and every day they, they cleaned it, but every day they had to put it on. They didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't sleep in their armor. And so what I'm saying, God wants us to stay dressed. We have an armor that we can stay dressed 24-7. We don't need to take off our armor to go to bed. The soldiers had to take off their armor, their helmet, and their breastplate, and all that stuff to go to bed. But we should be going to bed with our armor on. Isn't that right? And so, but when he said, Paul was implying here, when he said take, that means to pick the thing up. And so Satan, when he goes around looking for who he can devour, he's looking for people whose shield is laying on the ground. He's looking for people whose, whose shield, uh, whose breastplate of righteousness is in the closet. Right. They haven't had the thing on for three months, since three months after they got born again. Why? Because the enemy comes, they, every, you know, we get saved, we get all happy. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm born again, I'm created in Christ Jesus. We're all excited and happy. And then what? Stuff happens. Our past comes back to haunt us. Our friends come back to tell us who, who we are, not in Christ Jesus. And so then we just take the armor, and then it, it's just laying all over the pit place. It's still in the bag, in the armor bag. We have it, we just don't have it on. And so, but God has given us uh, the armor and, and, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, so that we can fight this invisible enemy. And what, I, what I'm saying today is we, we have an enemy who is always working and planning while you sleep, when you're driving your car, while we're doing anything 24-7. He's always planning on how he can inflict a Christian and inflict us. And so as Christians, we need to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And we have to realize that we can't just lay around and not know what the word of God says, not have our armor on, not being prepared to grab a two-edged sword whenever we need it when we're faced with different things. We need to know that we always have to be prepared. You know, I remember uh, a, a few years ago, a, um, uh, th there was a, a, we had a guest speaker come here, and she saw a vision, and, uh, and she saw, she said, I see the members of your church, they're laying in bed. She said, they're sleeping. Now, I know she wasn't just talking about living faith. I believe she was talking about, in, a, in addition to living faith, she's talking about Christians in general, that we are, we can be spiritually asleep while the enemy is awake all the time with his, with his 
organized, strategic plans. He's got principalities. Then he's got powers. It's, it's an order. Principalities, those are high positions of power and authority. Then there's powers. That's delegated authority to carry out evil. Then he says, and we wrestle not against uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against uh, the third one is rulers of the darkness. Uh, rulers of the darkness, it comes from a word cosmocraterus, cosmo and it means it deals with discipline, organization, and commitment. So we don't wrestle against people. We're wrestling, wrestling against demons and an enemy who is disciplined, organized, and committed. Well, guess who else should be disciplined, organized, and committed? A, a, a preacher, the Lord told him, that's what's wrong with my people. He, he said, the devil is disciplined, organized, and committed but I've given my church more power than over the power of the enemy. Didn't Jesus say that? He said, I've given you power over all, all the power of the enemy. So we as a church, as a body, we're stronger than the enemy. But, we, but it's hard to tell because we ain't committed, we're not disciplined, and we're not focused. How many of you know? Uh, well, I know focus wasn't one of the words. But how many of you know, you know, <laughs> one of the things that, upsets me is that how many Christians do you know who don't even go to church and and they and they you know for the most part I don't even think they think it's okay I mean they they kind of sort of but when you but I'm, I'm told when you talk to them they 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 have no power they have no conviction they're just wandering around. And so, I mean, even that, God's, God's will is the local church for us to serve God, to, to, to be together, to learn one another, to encourage one another to good works. But, but God's saying, I've given you the real power, but be, you're not, because believers aren't committed and they're not organized and they're not disciplined. How many of you know somebody, you know, um, if it rains, they still go to work. I'm not talking to nobody here. <laughs> when it rains, they still go to work. But when it rains, they don't come to church. Isn't that right? We give stuff up for our jobs in a heartbeat. But when it comes to the church, all of a sudden, nobody, oh, it doesn't take all that. Like God is sloppy and and, and not organized. But God is organized. And he is strategic. And he wants us to be disciplined. He wants us to be disciplined to read our word. He wants us to be disciplined to pray. Right? He wants us to be disciplined in coming to church. He wants us to be disciplined in making some good confessions instead of us making sad confessions all the time y'all hear what I'm saying and so God told the preacher he said my people have more power tell the person next to you you have more power than the enemy's power that is the devil but you got to be committed you got to be organized and you got to be disciplined does anybody hear what I'm saying tonight And, and I know that's the truth. There is too much casual Christianity. I'm still shocked and amazed and appalled. You know, I got saved 32 years ago, uh, I guess, 33. Um, when I was growing up spiritually, I mean, I'm still growing. But when I was growing up spiritually, we didn't play that mess. We were at church. We loved going to church. We, we loved hearing the word of God. We loved serving God. We were hungry for the things of God. We were hungry for the words. Anybody else here? I mean, that's just how we grew up. That's how we grew up spiritually. But no, no, not today. Everybody's all casual. And then, then we always need to cry out to God like, God, fix my life. Hey, how about if you get disciplined and, and, uh, and committed? And then I can do something in your life. 
Find, find out what my promises are. Find out what my word says. Put it to practice. The, the only thing that, you know, we're not just supposed to prove God with the tithe. He says, prove me now here with, test me. But he wants us to prove, prove him out with all of his word. Right? It's not just Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. He wants us to prove out that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He wants us to prove once in a while that all things are possible uh, with God. All things are possible to him that believeth. But we got to believe. We got to believe what? We got to believe God. Because faith is being what? It's being fully persuaded in God and his promises. Faith is being fully persuaded in God and his word and his promises. That's what faith is. But it's faith in God that's going to get us what we need. Not just faith in this chair. Not just faith that our car is going to start up. You know, not just faith we're going to get a paycheck. No, I'm talking about faith in God and his promises and all everything that he says from Genesis to Revelation. Amen? And so we have an enemy who's working all the time when we sleep, when we're driving, when we're sitting here. He's making plans. He wants to get us. He wants to draw us in. He wants to cause us to fail. He wants us to say faith doesn't work. He wants to get us to think that God doesn't work. He wants us to think that I'm not supposed to have anything. He wants to th us to think that I'm just a failure. He wants us to think I'm not going to be anything ever. I'm just always going to be who I am. I'm always going to have what I have. I'm always going to be where I am. But he's looking for an opening. And so our enemy, it, we're, we're wrestling against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. I want to I'm gonna, um, share with you before I, before I stop. Um, how many of you realize we, that we have an enemy? Whether we, you know, we have to believe in God whether we feel like it or not. Well, on the, on the same, in the same way, we have to believe that we have an enemy, whether we feel like we do or not. And he's got all of us in his sight. Is that what you call a thing on a rifle, on a gun? He had a cross. No. Sight. <laughs> Mr. Marshall trying to get me to say crosshairs. I know in some type of way it is. Crosshairs? Scope? He got his eye on you, okay? And so he, he doesn't quit. So, so there's never a time where we should feel like we've arrived. Even though everything's peachy, keen, cool right now, no, no troubles, we still have to live and believe like trouble's coming. And so we always have to be prepared. So that means when, you know, like I said, soldiers, they took, when there was no war or when they, I don't, they might have slept in their arm, I don't know, in the middle of the night if they were still in war. But when the war's over, they take their stuff off. But we can't take our stuff off. Do you all hear what I'm saying? We can't take off the helmet of salvation. We can't take off our breastplate of righteousness. You know, with salvation and what we believe in salvation, that's going to protect our mind. The head is where all the, the vital things are, right? Everything we do is based on what's in our head and in our minds and in our hearts. But we have to make sure we keep on our protection. I said I was going to uh, read something to you. I want to... Uh, just to give you an idea of who the enemy is, okay? I'm going to read, you, read some names. All right. These are just some scriptures. In Revelation chapter 10, 12 and verse 10, he's the accuser. How many of you ever felt that or been in that position where your invisible enemy is your accuser? Well, we need to know who's doing that. 
It's, God's not accusing us that's under, of something that's under the blood. He'll point out current sin so that we can repent and get the thing out the way. That's why God wants us to repent. The devil wants us to go to the side, go alone, be isolated. But God said, repent from your heart, get rid of the thing, and then put your shields up. Stop taking your shield of faith down because you feel guilty about something. Then cut it out. We need to just cut it out and then get right with God again and put your shields up. Isn't that right? So he's the accuser. God is not accusing you of anything. It's that invisible, organized, disciplined enemy that you have who is always looking to get you. He's called the adversary in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. He's called Beelzebub in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 25. He's called the devil, which we, we saw in Ephesians chapter 6 and 1 Peter uh, chapter 5 and verse 8. He's called the dragon in Revelation 12, 9. Uh, how many of you know that enemy? He sounds ominous. He sounds evil because he is. Praise God. But God has given us power over him. He's called the evil one in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. In John 8, 44, he's called a murderer. In John chapter 12, and verse 31, he's called the prince of this world. Remember, a prince is somebody in high authority. Principalities that denotes high positions of power and authority in the heavenlies. And so Satan's got all these evil names for, to give us an indication of how he thinks, what he wants, what his plan is. His plan for us is evil. His plan for us is to accuse us. He's called the prince of demons. He's got demons under his authority. He, he's the prince, and he's got demons under him, and he's got enough of them to be assigned to, to uh, the whole church. Amen? He, uh, I said he's called a murderer already. And, of course, he's called, in 1 Peter 5, he's called a roaring lion. Amen. So we have to know what the word of God says so that when he comes roaring and lying to us and accusing us, that that roar doesn't mean anything. How many of you know when a lion roars, he, you, you better hope he's behind them bars? You ever been to the zoo and, they, and the, the lion in that small building and he growls and say, oh, my God, this, what a sound. It's, it's, it's petrifying. It's paralyzing. But we need to know what we have so that when the devil comes ro like a roaring lion, we don't shake in our boots. We make him shake in his boots and we make him run. And the Bible says to resist the devil and he'll flee. We're supposed to be putting him on the run, not him putting us on the run. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? So we need to just get sick and tired of the devil putting us on the run. And we need to start knowing what God has said about us and what God has promised about us and what God, the power that God has given to us. He put the Holy Spirit on the inside of us to guarantee our success. And so God hasn't left us helpless. And I believe that God is tired of seeing his church powerless and helpless and beggars. God, throw me a crumb. We shouldn't be like the woman who came and asked Jesus for crumbs. She, didn't get bo she wasn't born again yet. And Jesus was making a point. And she didn't have salvation, so she wasn't one of the children yet. Tell the person next to you, but you are a child. And a child eats off of the top of the table, out of a plate, not the crumbs on the floor. Not what somebody else is leaving for us to eat. No, we eat off the top of the table. We're the ones we're supposed to be, we're the ones supposed to be eating off a plate that has a gold charger and a, a glass with gold fringe on it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway find out what God says read his word so that we can fight with it it's 830 can we go to 
Go to Luke. Luke chapter 4. More in there. Luke chapter 4. How many of you know Jesus knew the word? And he was the word. And even though he was the word, he was a man that walked in the flesh. He was the son of God, but he was human. And he still went to synagogue. And he still read the scriptures. And so the word of God comes in two forms. The loin belt, the, loin, the, the, the belt of truth is the written word of God. Jesus said, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Right? And then Ephesians 6, it talks about using the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And I explained to you the last time that the word, the sword of the spirit, that means a t it, it's a two-edged sword. It's a sword that has two sharp sides. See, in war, the Romans had at least three different kinds of swords. Two had a dull side, but one had two sides. That was the dangerous one, but it was the shortest one. And it, it was the one that brought death quickly. And so it's the one that you jabbed the enemy with. And they said the thing only had to be two inches long in order to kill a man. And then it had a, a, a curve at the tip so that when you yanked it out the person, all their guts came out. Making Rosemary squirm. But we have an enemy. And I don't care if I pull out his innards. In the spirit, as long as I don't see it. <laughs> but the sword of the spirit, that was the smallest one. It's the one that you pull out only when you need it. It was the quickest. It was the fastest. It was the most effective when you wanted to get rid of an enemy and knock your enemy off. And so Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about taking the sword of the spirit which is a spoken word from God. How many of you, God can't enlighten, he can't make the word, his word as a two-edged sword if we don't even have it with one side. We don't have the basis. We don't have the, our loins girt about with the word. We don't even know what this says. So when the Holy Spirit wants to tell us something for a situation, ain't nothing, that, what are we going to say? So he brings it alive when the enemy comes so we can jab that joker and tell him. So this is what Jesus was doing in, in uh, Luke chapter 4. Let's look at that. Did I give you all that? Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Led by who? Oh, my gosh, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted? How could God do such a thing? Well, God was working on something. And thank God, he's an example for us here tonight. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This is after he got baptized by John the Baptist. Verse uh, 2, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Verse 4, Jesus answered. What, what did he answer? Did he answer, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me? No, he didn't say that. What did he say? He said what the Holy Spirit told him to say, which was appropriate for that moment. The Holy Spirit told him what to say because he was full of the word, and the Holy Spirit could enlighten him and tell him to say this word right now for this scripture because the man was hungry. How many of you know when you're hungry for 40 days, you can get confused in your flesh, I don't care, yes, turn it into bread, I'm hungry, right? That's what some Christians would have said, I'll do anything, just give me some food. 
But Jesus answered, he said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, they did hand everything over. Man had it, and he handed it over to the enemy. So this statement, Jesus could have fell for it. But no, say Jesus had to do things God's way. This was not God's way. He had to defeat the enemy. And he was going to get the authority in the end. But what did Jesus say? Verse 7. He said, if you worship, no, I'm sorry, he said that. If you worship me, did we finish? Go to 6. Yeah, go back to 6. I'm sorry. I will give you all the authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone that I want to. Verse 7. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Verse 8. Jesus answered. This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to be able to answer with the sword of the Spirit, which is the now word. It's the fresh word. It's the word that we need right now for the situation that we're going through right now. He said, it is written. Why? Jesus needed this now because he was being tempted for real. It, it would be a lie. If this, wasn't a, if this situation wasn't a real temptation for Jesus, this would be a fake story. Do you understand that? So if it says Jesus was tempted, then he was tempted because he was man also. But he said, the Holy Spirit quickened him. It Remember, he just got baptized in the Holy Ghost. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He got that from Scripture. He didn't just make that up. That was written. Ver, uh, look at the next verse. The devil led him to uh, uh, the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. Verse 10. For it is written, Jesus, uh, no, this is still the devil. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. I'm, I apologize, I don't have the verses in my notes where this verse came from. But he's quoting the Bible. Where it says, it says, you're right, Psalm 91, where he says, I will give my angels charge over you. And so what did he say? For it is, uh, no, no, go to verse 11. They will, uh, he, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. He's still quoting scripture. This is the devil quoting scripture. But now Jesus says, but Jesus answered. Now the devil used scripture against him. But Jesus came with the right scripture at the right time to get him on to the next place in God, to get him through this temptation successfully so that we can read it tonight and know that when the devil comes at us, that if we have the right scriptures, we don't have to know the whole Bible, y'all. We don't have to know the whole Bible. But God will use the Bible that we do know just when we need to know it to fight an enemy that we can't see, who's always trying to bring us down, who's always trying to attack us. And God will bring us just the right thing to say. And he, Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Verse 13, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. So what Jesus did, what we can do, is when the enemy shows up in our lives to tempt us to disbelieve God, to do things the wrong way, the devil was trying to get Jesus to take the fast way out. But Jesus had to go to the cross. There are things that God wants you to do that you're going to have to go through and not take any shortcuts because God's trying to work some in your life and in your heart and cause you to see that you can fight the good fight of faith and then he'll take you on to the next step. 
And so Jesus was tempted. He was hungry. He could have wanted to make something in the bread. He, he could have bypassed the cross. He didn't want to go. We know that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if you can take this cup away from me, please take it away from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. So Jesus was honestly being tempted to take a shortcut because Satan did own everything, but Jesus had to defeat him. And when Jesus was finished, he said, all power is given unto me. And now you go, therefore, and preach to all nations, showing them everything that I taught you. And what Jesus was saying, all authority has been given to me because I went the right way. I did things the way God wanted it to do it. Because the way, the, 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 the way that God wants us to travel is going to make eternal impact. Not temporary impact. Whatever our flesh accomplishes is going to be temporary. But when we obey God, it's going to cause eternal impact. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I want stuff that's going to last. Amen? I want, to do, I want things that are going to stick. I want, I want to do things the way, I want to do things so that I have God's help. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, for, uh, says that though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. But, and the key word is mighty through God. Right? So the, this fight that we fight, we can't fight it on our own. We can't fight it because we have a title. We can't fight it because we have a license. We can't fight it because we have man's authority. No, we need God's might. We need his power because he knows that we fight an enemy who is strategic and committed and disciplined. And now God wants us to be strategic and committed and disciplined so that we can fight the good fight of faith, so that we can win. And so that we can have, having done all the stand, we're still going to be standing. And that means on your, on your feet. Amen? I want y'all stand to your feet tonight. I know some of you tired, but I just want to have you stand to your feet just as a, just as a visual, just as a natural example of what God wants us to do. And so God has given us his word. God's given us his promises. And not only that, he's given us the Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. He said, if you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, I'm going to give you power on high. So it's not like God hasn't equipped us. God wants us to win. He's destined us to win. He's called us to win. But we have to use what he gives us. And so we can't be sad and mad and bad and, did I say sad? Did I say mad? Did I say bad? He doesn't want us to be all those things. He wants us to win in every area of our lives. Amen? But he's given us the equipment to do that. But it takes faith. And he says, put, put your faith out there. So, so as we, you know, as we get into the word of God, as we use prayer, as we use our weapons, the helmet of salvation, uh, the, our breastplate, our loins girt, our feet shod, our shield of faith, our sword of the spirit, as we use these things, when the enemy comes, if we take care of ourselves, if we protect ourselves with the word of God, when the enemy comes and he tries to wipe us out, we're going to still be standing Tell the person next to you, say, stay standing. Stay standing. Say, find out what to do in every situation so that you can stand. Say, stop being the victim. Say, be the victor that God has called you to be. Be the more than conqueror that God has set you up to be. Say, stop crying. Find out what you got. Find what your weapons are and put your shield up and fight this good fight of faith in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, you can uh, just be seated just for a moment. I just want to give an invitation 
for anyone tonight. I don't want to, we don't want to leave. We don't want to end service and have anybody who came here tonight who you came with the intention of getting born again. You know, God loves you. He has a plan for you. If you're sitting here tonight and, and, and right now, you don't know where, if you died, you don't know where you'd end up. But God wants you in heaven. He wants you in his kingdom. He wants you fulfilling his plan for your life.